Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal here. Today we have a professional conversation for a change. This one about uh, impact investing. And uh, I had the chance recently to meet uh, Noga, who's with me here today, who's a really, really important player in the Israeli impact investing ecosystem. Before we get going with the uh, conversation, um, I'm firstly, just a disclaimer that I work in the office of Sir Ronald Cohen, who is the founding father of impact investing in Israel and um, Ronnie and uh, Noga know each other as well. So a bit about Noga. Noga is the CEO of GreenEye and the managing partner of Valued Square Investing, the responsible investment house. And uh, we want to talk today a little bit about impact investing in Israel, where we are, not just the vision for it, but where we actually are today in terms of real awareness in the market, in terms of actual financial instruments. In response to that sort of broad question, where are we with impact investing in Israel right now in, well, almost 2023? Okay, so first of all, thank you for having me. I think impact investing, if we look at it in the broad way, if we include ESG investments in it, it's in the beginning stage. Um, I think we are 10 years back than uh, lagging uh, from uh, Europe, uh, but we are moving, we are moving, and I think we can divide the impact space into two fields. I think if we look at the inv investors, institutional investors, they are really starting to integrate ESG and starting to see that it's real risks, and that's why they integrate it. And from in the startup world, I think people are starting to speak about impact in the not in the private equities, but in startups, in all those small investments. Mm -hmm. And impact became also in Israel, a word that everyone speaks about. So, so the the awareness uh, for for impact investment is there. And tell us a little bit because you're obviously you manage an impact fund. Uh, tell us a little bit about your fund and is it the only impact fund in Israel, at least of its size? Uh, so we are managing a family of funds. It's called Value Squared. It's part of the Value Squared Investment uh, Responsible Investment House. And we have funds, uh, global funds and uh, North America funds and Israeli funds that we provide uh, our investors an option to invest in the public equity world. That's, that's a unique part. And we are bringing impact into that part of the investments. What we mean by impact, we uh, our, com our funds have an integration of ESG. We are taking only companies that are above average or are high in their ESG. But also we are looking for those companies that have SDGs. SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, I'm sure you spoke about it. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of looking at which companies are potential have already are looking at their potential and are uh, creating products and services that are aligned with the SDGs, with sustainable development goals. So we, our company that we invest in, our, the stock we invest in are, first, they have ESG, second, SDGs, and the third pillar is financial. So we are looking, uh, the third part is that we're looking on those companies that we think will bring returns. So it's not just that, it's the combination, it's the integration between ESG, impact and uh, and uh, financial and that's why when we invest we f we see that we we can measure our impact in our funds we see that our funds are have a quarter of the carbon footprint of other uh, financial financial products we have more com uh, our in in general we have more revenue from sdgs we have better scores in esg so we can measure how good our impact is in our value squared funds. And I, I presume you talk with a lot of Israeli companies, um, the UN SDGs, how much do you think, you know, this whole, they are in, on the radar of Israeli companies, especially, do you see a difference maybe between, obviously Israel has a crazy startup ecosystem and if less uh, big companies, are they on the radar? And, uh, you know, is it something you see all companies having a commitment to certain UN SDGs or is it sort of not really only the more sustainable ones are really sort of thinking about that? So I think in terms of uh, companies, I think is, as you said, we need to divide it. The big companies, some of them are very aware and are starting to build their portfolio, their impact portfolio, their SDGs uh, products and services that they are building and they are structuring. 
But in the majority of the companies, I, if we would ask them what's SDGs, I'm not sure if they'll know. Mm. And then we have the small companies. Some of them are also, by the way, traded, but they started as startups and they, own, they became public. And they are more aware and that's some of them that's their main uh, that's their main flag mm. so we see them but then the problem is that some of those companies don't have esg so you can see companies that are have the idea is brilliant they are uh, pr uh, they are um, proactive in what they are developing and they are really helping uh, to bring the sdgs into israel but in terms of management in terms of their corporate governance they're still they're still back and still behind. So mm -hmm. it's a combination that is sometimes problematic. If you, if you took a company like you mentioned, a small Israeli company, let's say like a Wix, or you know, some of the Israeli uh, companies that IPO'd last year, do you think it's something that if uh, you know, the next Wix or, or Payoneer, whatever the case may be, looking to expand into the US, that would be kind of the time where they really have a thought to, okay, we need to sort of actually, you know, really have maybe a chief sustainability officer or, you know, put out voluntary disclosure, that's kind of the pivot point uh, for that. You, you, do you think that's fair to say? I think, uh, first of all, yes. I think uh, foreign investors always bring the news to Israel. So I think it will be something that will make them move. I think their awareness is getting better. They are getting more, uh, becoming more aware. I think till now, some of them thought that even if they uh, went public two years ago, they could just ignore that part of development and we'll do it later and mm -hmm. i think once now that the institutional investors are looking at it they understand that they need to catch up and start moving and start managing it mm -hmm. it's not that they're not disclosing they're just not managing it they are mm -hmm. used to be uh, some of them i'm not saying i'm not I'm, I'm trying not to generalize but they are used to be uh, friends bring a friend and then it looks like the management it is not diverse and the way they uh, measure things they, uh, is not systematic. So it's all those things that I think foreign investments will definitely push them there. I think even then it will be, I think even the Israeli market itself will push them there. Something uh, that Sarani said at the World Zionist Organization Conference in Basel was this idea of turning startup nation into impact nation in Israel, leveraging its small size to not just become another uh, you know, country with impact, but actually sort of a leader. But you're saying if Israel is 10 years behind, do you see it actually being able to sort of make that jump to actually becoming a leading force in the impact movement? I think yes, because in, the, in terms of startups, we are, we are in the front line. And I think uh, the Israeli uh, uh, characteristic of being an initiator and uh, entrepreneurs, I think will help us go very, uh, will go and jump this uh, part. So I think we can be an impact nation as uh, Sir Ronald Cohen said. Um, and I think it's one of the th main things that were very interesting in Basel, I also was there, is that when they spoke Zionism, they spoke impact. And that's the next Zionism. If we wanna be uh, the Zionism 21, is impact is where it, we bring industry to make to make a better world. So I think it's definitely something that we can catch up. And I think in terms of investments and in terms of startups, we can definitely be there. Mm. Oh, yeah, I think there's an amazing parallel that I think uh, Ronnie talks about between Tikkun Olam and the sort of Jewish mission of up until now, maybe Israel has been focused on just, you know, getting by and from a security standpoint, also, you know, becoming a tech powerhouse, but that the next sort of evolution in that movement is actually thinking in a much more international global scale of how you can benefit. So I want to talk a little bit about the uh, knowledge of impact. You are obviously a financial professional both looking at sort of the general public day-to-day, -day, uh, something that sort of I've noticed is, you know, simply setting up a pension fund myself, very, very small level of scale for, okay, do you guys have an ESG track? The kind of response that I got back personally was, why do, why would you want that? Uh, or what's ESG or what's impact? A kind of skepticism combined with maybe like a lack of knowledge. So do you think that's something widespread? And in terms of the general public, do you see it changing? I think the general public are not aware yet that their money, when they're not looking, is doing something, is impacting in its own way. 
So we are speaking about impact always and we think of the being uh, proactive. But what we are saying here is that even if you are not proactive, you are impacting. You are impacting in a negative way, but you are impacting. So I think that's our first stage, that to explain to people that when you're not involved and you're not choosing, you are choosing. Mm -hmm. So that's something that is starting to pe for people to be aware of. And um, I think it's, uh, there is, for example, a Forum Kesef Naki, fossil fuel uh, a movement that is trying to push company, uh, to, to push investor investments to, ta to, do, to take out um, a fossil from their, uh, from their portfolio. But I think what we are trying to explain to them that it's not there. It's not only there. That's a good way of explaining it because it's binar, like it's all fossil fuel or not. But mm -hmm. I think more and more people have to understand that those companies, you can, uh, you can invest in those companies that are doing good, that are uh, uh, have a diverse uh, employment uh, mm. uh, team, uh, and they have more. They they are looking at uh, uh, they are looking better and on the workers, and we can see that that's where we impact. So if we speak about the general public, I think we have a long way to explain to them. Mm -hmm. But once we ask, we'll manage to explain to them why they should care, I think they will start asking for it. Mm -hmm. And now let's go to the institutional investors. Mm -hmm. For many, many years I'm in the field and I knocked on the doors of so many of them. And I met them throughout those years. And it was, they were reluctant to moving. And, um, they, it, and they're not bad people. They just, you know, they're, when they're so busy, that's the last thing they could do. Mm -hmm. The last thing that they will think of in uh, volunteering. But then came the regulator uh, almost a year and a half ago and said to them, people, it's not for you to decide. You need to start looking at those issues. And once the regulator said that, we see a very interesting move in most of the institutional investors and they are starting to integrate. And GreenEye is now providing a database on 600 companies on for a lot of the, uh, uh, for, for many of those institutional investors, and they're using it. It's and a database of Israeli companies. What's in your database? It's an ESG database on the Israeli companies. Mm. And it's a database that didn't exist before because if you look at the international uh, indices, ESG indices, and uh, ESG databases, mm. Israel didn't interest them. Most of the 600 didn't, weren't covered. The most that in one of the um, database, it was like 50 or 100. So they never really had something to look at those companies. So now they do have, and they are, they are integrating. But we is, it, is it both public and uh, private companies that you guys look at? We look only on the public, mm -hmm. because that 600 are being traded in uh, the Tel Aviv okay. stock market. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting to see is that it's the evolution. Like we are not asking, and I think people that are asking, it's not feasible. We're not asking them to move 180 uh, degrees. We need them to move uh, very uh, responsible, responsibly, and move slowly in order to get there. Because we need to remember the institutional investors are managing a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And we are... That's why I'm le I'm more interested of uh, for, of real changes on the way they work and starting to integrate it in their real day to day work than really big um, announcements that then they find out that it's more difficult to to go and mm. to implement. So it sounds like you're saying that the kind of understanding of impact at the moment in Israel is a lot like kind of socially responsible investing that, you know, these are the exclusion criteria. We don't invest in fossil fuels and trying to move that forward to, you know, the actual idea of you can do positive things with your, with your, with your capital. I think in terms of institutional investors, they are not looking at excluding because in the Israeli market, they can't really exclude. It's a very small market mm -hmm. and it's, they have a lot of money to invest and they don't really want to exclude. And I understand it. What we want to do is we, we want to first look at the positive part and we want to use another thing that is called engagement. Because one of the main things that we can see from the world that engagements of investment, engagement 
processes of investors in companies could make a whole difference. So I think the only day-to-day -day engagement that your average Israeli worker, a high-tech worker, or someone like me, you know, a personal pension fund has with this whole world is through their own uh, pension, right? And you don't, as you say, you don't really think about it. You typically, uh, in Israel, for those watching from other countries, your company has a pension agent. You tick a few boxes. Usually you sign your name like 20 times on some paperwork and that's it. You have your pension set up and no one really looks into it further. So something I mentioned earlier that I was looking for an ESG track from the major Israeli pension houses and um, I read that there was some kind of regulation uh, coming in that, as you said it, you know, not putting that option in the hands of the pension companies that the actual regulator would mandate that these pension houses would have a ESG or sustainable investment or impact track. So where exactly is that regulation? Is it implemented or what happened? So in terms of regulation, they won't mandate it, but they will allow it. And that's a move because till now, uh, according to the regulation, you weren't allowed to call a pension fund an ESG as a track. Mm. So now that's first a first move from the regulator saying that you are allowed. Uh, it's it's it will be starting in in, in two, uh, 2023. We're not sure if it's January or June, but it's the beginning. They're starting. Uh, it should start then. But uh, what's imp important is that now the institutional investors will be able to offer us pension funds in different tracks that if it's a pension, it has to have SDGs. That's part of the regulation. Mm -hmm. But if it's not a if it's a different part of a long term investment, you can also have uh, ESG pension fund. So it will start allowing pension funds and institutional investors to give an option of that to the general public. And I think that will also help educate because most of the money of the public is through the pension funds. Mm. And until today, the companies, investment companies couldn't offer pension funds. So now it is going to be on the table. So I hope people will understand that it's an option. And if they'll do good in terms of financially, I'm sure people will move there. Right, because then I guess the process of word of mouth spreads once it's an option and people are happy with their returns and maybe their pension advisor. So besides that kind of typical day-to-day -day world, the smaller world of maybe family offices, just curious, uh, because there's a lot of discussion around the world now that family offices and uh, philanthropy organizations are getting involved in this. Uh, is, that a, is that something that exists in Israel? And uh, do you see they're also moving towards this? Yeah, I think there are. I think uh, we can see family offices that are, when they're allocating the money, they could see more impact invest in investments in, in the public world and in the, in the private, uh, private uh, investments also. So I see, I see this kind of investment. I think in, so, in many ways, those smaller, com smaller uh, financial uh, organizations, are, it's easier for them. Because in impact investments and in impact investing, you usually don't need a lot of money. Mm. And w one of the things that are problematic in the institutional investors is that every investment is quite big. So if it's a different scale, mm. it's a problem for them to invest. But that's another thing that is, is we are creating the market. So there will be funds of uh, of public of uh, impact uh, companies and it will be funds of funds it's things that are building now and we see more and more of that and we see also an organization called ifi ifie mm -hmm. that is helping this ecosystem to that's the israeli israeli forum for the impact economy which is the i'm saying this again for for context because it is really something i think a very very justifiable criticism of the impact movement generally is what's you know alphabet soup right and uh something i've heard people saying is that it's actually getting worse over time as uh, as this goes on and it catches on so uh the gsg is ad advocating for global uh, impact investment globally it works on the ground through national advisory boards nabs and the israeli national advisory board who i want to give a shout out to because vanessa who uh who runs it does tremendous work is the IFIE. Exactly. And I think the fact that this organization exists means that the ecosystem is stopped moving. 
because I think that's one of the way we build it. We build a cooperation between different parts of the ecosystem, and I think that will, will make it different. Looking towards the future, um, where do you see impact investing going in Israel? Um, 2023 is in what, like 10 days from now? So we're almost in the new calendar year. Uh, this change in regulation is going to open up the, hopefully the discourse of impact among the general public. Uh, what else do you see happening in impact investing in Israel uh, in this coming calendar year? I think it's going to be ma more and more mainstream. I don't know if it will be 2023. I think it's, it's a longer process, but I think that we'll find more and more companies um, showing off with their SDGs and with their, our imp their impact part. That's one thing. I think, um, I hope that they'll start measuring more. So they'll speak about it more as a, measure, a measured issue. So I think that will be another thing. And I think that because of what we see in the pension funds and because of the other things, I see that we are seeing, more, I think that the general public will once will be more aware and they'll have more options of investment. So it's going there. I think we'll always have to be cautious of greenwashing because when, a, you know, when it's starting, everyone is, it, when, a st when we see a trend, at the beginning you see only bits and pieces that are professional, people that are all uh, dedicated for that. But when it, become, it becomes mainstream, everyone wants to do it. Mm. And that's why we need to be cautious from Greenwashing, not in the sense that people are doing only some of it, they will, I'm sure that uh, we'll find people also doing things that are, they could get away with not doing the real thing. But what I'm sure of is that people will become more and more aware. So it won't work, it won't work for the long term. And one, you know, looking at the future, I guess one way of thinking about that is organizing these conferences. So you recently attended COP27 in uh, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. Um, what did you think about that? What did you make in terms of the what was discussed there? And it's sort of, do you think it was, uh, it's going to move the movement in a good direction? Um, Sharm was my third COP. It's uh, the climate change uh, um, yearly conference. I've been to Denmark, into Co uh, Co to Copenhagen in 2009, and last year in Glasgow, and this year in Sharm. If I look at the what happened in Glasgow compared to Sharm, Sharm was a disappoint uh, is was a disappointment. Mm. I think in many ways, first of all, what we what we came out of uh, Sh uh, what came out of Sharm is a is quite a disappointing thing. Of, they didn't decide on to keep 1.5 degrees uh, decision to keep that as a target. They didn't, they didn't cancel it, but they didn't uh, speak about trying to understand how we get there. Um, the fossil fuel issue wasn't, uh, was discussed, but at the end they left it as it is, phasing out in a very vague way. One uh, good thing that happened is that the loss and damages fund, that is, is a nice thing, but it's, it's, not, it's still far from being implemented. It will be implemented this year. It's just becoming... They are going to build a committee and, it, and, and also we need to be aware that the word of loss and damages fund is a bit uh, misleading mm. because it's not really, we are not going to compensate them for what we, what we, uh, what we the developed world did, for, uh, did to them, mm. but we are going to help them if they have, uh, if they have problems while they have like uh, after hurricanes and stuff like, like that, they'll have some money to repair. Mm. So I think it's, people look at it as a very big achievement because Americans, a America and the EU didn't like, uh, didn't want to do it. You're saying it's, it's ignoring the price the developing world is already paying for yeah. the huge amount of emissions yeah. contributed way, way disproportionately by, well, the US, but also other parts of the developed world. Uh, yeah, the whole, it's like uh, we, we know that the developing world is paying for what the developed world did. And it's not, this fund is not going to compensate it. It's just going to help them deal the with- Specific disaster. Yeah, deal with disaster. That is nice, but, mm. but why do I think it was, um, it was disappointing? Because I, th and I think we would know it from the beginning. First of all, it came after Ukraine, the war in Ukraine and the problem of, of energy and the price rise of, uh, of oil 
and that means that it was very profitable to invest in oil. Um, that was the beginning part. That's how it started. Um, so it wasn't a good start. But I think another problem is that I found that was uh, not not helping, if we can say the least, is that the Egyptian from the beginning said that they're not they won't allow demonstrations. Mm -hmm. So all the idea of civil society uh, bringing the issue of urgency didn't exist there. Right, because I think for COP26, that actually made much more headlines than the conference itself was the sheer amount of protests. I know, like, you know, almost almost attempting to bring the conference to a halt didn't happen, but, uh, and, you know, just looking at, 20, at COP27, that wasn't seen. Yeah, Glasgow spoke climate change. It's It spoke urgency. There was in sun on Sunday there was the big demo, uh, big rally of uh, climate change. The, it was like hundred of thousands of people rallied on the streets about speaking about climate change, and I think the leaders felt it because and then they didn't have the option of not getting into a deal. Here it was. The demonstrations were plastic, like there were mm. five people standing in the conference rooms. It wasn't really. And you didn't hear it. You didn't feel the urgency. So why bother? Mm. You need to, uh, we need to remember leaders, they need to make an effort to make it happen. They need, they need to see it in their face. They need to be heckled, pushed. eggs thrown yeah. at them. They need to be pushed. They need to understand that if they don't do it, they won't get away with it. Mm. And in, in Shangham, it, did, it wasn't it. It wasn't there. You think that, that accountability from the general public, it was a missed, missed opportunity. I don't, yeah, I think it, it, if you ask the leaders, I don't know if they'll say that's why we didn't decide it. But I think there was this idea of we will get away with not deciding, mm. allow it to happen. But and there's not that long to go until 2030. Yeah, but the next, uh, uh, first of all, yes, we need to start moving. I think we just spoke here, we just spoke about climate change. But I think what we see is that in many, many ways through climate change, we see so many other problems that we have to deal with and we need to rush. And that's why going back to impact investing and responsible investment is so important because that's where money is. That's what will decide how the economy will move and where will it move to. It's the, the, world, the, world, the world doesn't have time for a bad cop or for a less than ideal cop one thing that is uh, did happen in the cop and we we saw a couple of achievements not in the not in the big decisions but in small decisions like um, first of all the f financial financial institution in the world understand that they need to go net zero for 2050 with from moving from now so that's one move that we saw in glasgow and continue now but also I, we saw some government things. For example, the American government decided the supply chain will have to go uh, to be uh, all, their supply, all their big supply chain uh, suppliers, meaning 85%, I think, from their suppliers will have to um, disclose their uh, climate change, uh, their climate change achievement. So it, it will start moving. There was this, I think, that compared to the disappointment in the in the high, in the decisions part, I think we see a lot of movements in the local part, local areas. And in terms of the big blocks, we're obviously also seeing the SEC proposal still out there, and the EU actually moving quicker um, to implement it. So thank you, Noga, firstly for all the insights you shared. Uh, if people want to follow more about your takes on all matters, impact investing, where would be the best place? I think, first of all, I'll be happy to join uh, for them to join in LinkedIn. But I think uh, www.value2.co.il is our uh, fun is our investment house uh, website. So it could be interesting, and we have a lot of things there happening. And also the Israeli Forum for the Impact Economy, who I mentioned, uh, they have a website as well, and that's sort of a key bridge builder between all the different parts of the Israeli impact ecosystem. So thank you, Noga, for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. I hope that was interesting. If you are an Israeli, uh, if you simply work in Israel and you have a pension, even if you're an Atzmai, you now have to have a pension. There's no getting out of having a pension. As Noga said, if your money, if you don't know what your money's doing, there's no such thing as money 
just doing nothing. It's doing something. And uh, keep your eye on developments in 2023 and keep pushing your pension funds for more impact and more ESG because the the the, the squeaky wheel gets uh, gets oil first, right? Is that how you say it? Yeah, I think every money you invest has to be responsible. It could be your five, if it's a five shekels or it's your pension funds, all of it, find out what it does. Thank you, Noga. Thank you.